Hello everyone, my name is Tegan Clary and I'm the VP of Marketing at Unchained Labs. I'll be your moderator today and I'm glad you're joining us. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. To ask questions, all you have to do is click on Q&A in the Zoom navigation bar at the top or the bottom of your screen and type your question. We'll get to as many of them as we can today. And now I'd like to introduce Rafar Jean Giles, our amazing application scientist analytics director. Today, Rafar will be taking us through analysis methods for full spectrum data, including the barycentric mean, fluorescence ratio, peak intensity, and peak area, and the unique insights attainable in construct screening or formulation optimization. And now I'll hand it over to Rafar. Thank you very much again for the kind introduction. I want to start by wishing all of you a warm welcome. Thank you for attending the first of a three-part series on Uncle. Specifically during the course of these three seminars, we're going to take a close look at the power of full spectrum differential scanning fluorometry, also known as DSF. The specific goal of part one is to introduce you to DSF, but also to prime you for part two and part three, where we'll put in full display the Uncle's exceptional ability to characterize protein instability, and empower formulations development. Characterizing protein should not be difficult, yet instruments which measure protein stability have historically been difficult to use, to operate. They often require specialized skill sets and they lack the flexibility required for the always evolving field of biopharmaceuticals development. And while there is a time and place for specialized tools, they're just not practical for the everyday user. DSC, or differential scanning calorimetry, is the gold standard for the measurement of melting temperatures. But they are very practical at most stages of biologics development, as they are complicated, the single purpose tools, which often require more samples than is available, while also having a very low throughput. For most of us nowadays, the more agile and feature-packed devices have become our everyday tools, because they are often easier to use, they are feature rich, uh, and they're much more suitable for everyday applications while still providing exceptional quality. The Uncle platform is our answer to the protein characterization question. It offers an easy to use, simple and sophisticated solution to life sciences. Uncle is an all-in-one stability platform built for biologics characterization. As we'll see in more details, it uses two lasers for either label-free protein intrinsic fluorescence or for dye-based fluorescence. With full-spectrum fluorescence, UNCLE opens you up to many possibilities. One can easily characterize the conformational stability of proteins while also simultaneously measuring aggregate formation. With the addition of DLS as a detector, the stability of your proteins can be fully and easily characterized. The three detectors may be used within the same experiment while performing either isothermal runs or by ramping up the temperature to thermally stress your samples and see which ones can take the heat. One of the key aspects of Uncle is its sample holder, the Uni. The small volume cartridge holds 16 nanometer quartz cuvettes. The Uni is optimized for both heat transfer and for optical sensitivity. Its design allows you to run anywhere from one sample at a time or up to all 16 cuvettes in each Uni. Any cuvette that isn't used may be used in future runs. And since each cuvette is individually compartmentalized, another benefit of the uni is that it eliminates the possibility of cross-contamination. Samples are easily loaded in the uni using a P10 or P20 micropipette. In fact, we often joke that if you can pipette, you can use the uncle. Once your samples are loaded, each uni is placed within the blue frame below, capped and covered using silicone seals. This allows you to feel confident that your sample will not only not evaporate over high temperature ranges or during overnight isothermal runs, but you may also feel confident that there's no e possibility of samples leaking out and leading to additional contaminations. Up to three units can be run at once, giving you a scalable throughput of up to 48 samples per run, which is considerably higher than traditional TM measuring platforms. In fact, here's a fun fact. Since the sample holder is completely sealed, Users routinely load their samples and stress them outside of the instrument using an oven to heat them up or by freezing them, for instance, and doing freeze-thaw cycles. And then they periodically return to the uncle to measure their stability 
using the exact same samples with which they began the experiment. That is something that is only possible using the Uncle platform. The technology by which Uncle measures stability is differential scanning ferrometry, or DSF. DSF gets its name from the related technology DSC. And just like DSC, we're using heat to stress the sample, allowing one to rank order their resistance to heat. That is where the similarity ends. In DSF, the readout is fluorescence, which can be intrinsic, relying on the person's inherent ability to emit light, or it may use dyes to facilitate the characterization. In principle, DSF uses a laser to accept the samples and the emitted light is measured. As the temperature increases, the sample itself undergoes a physical change which results in a change in the emitted light. And that is what we collect and characterize. When it comes to DSF, Uncle really raises the bar. The platform has three lasers, two of which are the focus of this presentation. The 266 nanometer laser, which is used for the measurement of the intrinsic fluorescence of proteins, and the 473 nanometer laser, which is used for the measurement of the extrinsic fluorescence of molecules with dyes. As the samples are read, all of the wavelengths are scanned and collected simultaneously using a CCD spectrophotometer, allowing you to capture a full spectrum at once, just like your smartphone captures a full color picture with every snapshot. So in short, the uncle is faster than traditional parameters, which scans one wavelength at a time and take quite a considerable amount of time to collect data, but also a considerable amount of time to process the results. Some folks try to get around this time limitation by only using two wavelengths. We'll see exactly why a full spectrum fluorescence is much more better. Uncle is also much more sensitive. It has been optimized for UV and fluorescence applications. And since we collect a full spectrum, you get all the information on the stability of your samples all at once. Uncle's DSF technology is particularly well suited to look directly at the changes in the microenvironment of your protein. Let's start with the characteristic spectrum here that we see for a protein at room temperature here in blue. The spectrum has a distinct intensity and specific wavelength at which the maximum intensity occurs. As the protein is heated to 65 degrees and subsequently to 75 degrees, the tertiary structure is disrupted and the core of the protein becomes exposed to the aqueous polar environment of your buffer. As the microenvironment within the core of the protein is changing, we see that the intensity decreases, but also the location of the maximum wavelength also begins to shift. If that shift is to the right, it is commonly called a redshift. If that shift is to the left, it is routinely called a blue shift. While red shifts are very common, the particular behavior of a protein that is, under, that is undergoing unfolding is not only impacted by the protein structure, but it is also a factor of the composition of the buffer. It is not unusual for the spectrum to change. In other words, you may see a protein in a given buffer undergo a red shift. If that protein is placed in a different buffer, it is possible to see it undergo a blue shift. And so the only way to truly know what's going to happen is to do the experiment. So here we are viewing a more detailed overview, if you want, or the overlay of the raw data, where the full collection of the spectrum is collected over a thermal ramp. In this particular example, the sample is excited at 266 nanometer, where we're observing the intrinsic fluorescence of spectrum at each temperature point. Uncle captures full spectrum fluorescence for each sample at every temperature. Each line of the graph is a fluorescence measurement of a protein starting with a reading at 15 degrees and going all the way up to 95 degrees Celsius. You may also see that for every single spectrum, we have a full spectrum collected from 250 up to 750 nanometer. You may also see that as the intensity decreases, this particular sample undergoes a redshift to the right. Other proteins may decrease in the fluorescence without a shift. The uncle's way of, with uncle's way of collecting full spectrum fluorescence, you have all the data at your disposal. You don't have to worry about any unexpected protein behavior. What exactly is responsible for intrinsic fluorescence? Proteins are generally made up of 20 essential amino acids, three of which are aromatic amino acids, tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. And they get their name from the aromatic rings, which are responsible or give them the ability to absorb and emit light. Note that small differences in the structure are slight, and yet they're able to give them significantly different properties. And so tryptophan has become a bit of a poster child for protein intrinsic fluorescence or even DSF. 
And this is because it is the strongest flow for of the three. It has what we call a high quantum yield or higher ability to convert the light absorbed into emitted light. Tyrosine is a pretty good fluorophore as well. Phenylalanine is the weakest. More than their relative strength as fluorophore, each amino acid has a unique absorption and emission profile. Tryptophan typically absorbs at 280 nanometer and emits from 300 to 500 nanometer. Tyrosine typically absorbs at about 274 nanometer and emits from 280 up to 400 nanometer. And finally, phenylalanine absorbs at about 258 nanometer optimally and typically emits from 250 to about 350 nanometer. This observation is not trivial, right? It is the combined emission of each amino acid, which result in the emission spectra of proteins. Furthermore, we see that each amino acid can be quenched, right? Or its signal, emission signal can be abated by special groups or even neighboring aromatic amino acids. So let's put things in perspective. Another way to look at this is by considering what happened if we were to excite at 280 nanometer. First, we will only excite two of the three aromatic amino acids, leaving out phenylalanine. On the emission side, there will also be some interference since the 208 nanometer cuts directly in the emission of tyrosine. Now, consider the oncol, for instance, which excites at 266 nanometer. This allows us to do three things. First, we're able to excite all three aromatic amino acids. And on the emission side, we're able to considerably reduce any occurrence or incidence of interference. But finally, the third benefit is that we have the ability to use that same laser to measure the aggregation, which is happening at the same time as your protein is unfolding. And so Onco excites all three aromatic amino acids with the full spectrum fluorescence. It empowers you to truly capture the stability of all of your protein. Imagine if you're the closet with just two color t-shirts, white and black. Every day, no matter what the occasion which presents itself, there will only be two choices, white shirt or black shirt, left side of the closet or right side of the closet. If you invite to a special event, white t-shirt or black t-shirt, wedding coming up, white t-shirt or black t-shirt, trip to the beach, white t-shirt or black t-shirt. It wouldn't take you long to realize that those options won't cut it. Pretty quickly, you'd run out of occasions for which these options are even applicable, right? And so if this sounds like a ridiculous situation for something as trivial as a wardrobe choice, ask yourself, why would anyone settle for only two wavelengths for something as important as protein characterization? It is good to have options. So Onco offers four built-in analysis methods, the barycentric mean or the BCM, the integrated intensity or the area under the curve method, the fluorescence ratio, which is typically the ratio of the intensity at 350 nanometer to the intensity at 330 nanometer, and finally, the peak height. Each method offers specific benefits. The BCM is the most versatile method and less susceptible or prone to noise. It's applicable to virtually 99% of proteins out there as it's reflecting both the shape of the denaturation curve and the emission spectra, but also the wavelength at which those samples are unfolding. The area is also well matched for samples which do not undergo a shape, such as small proteins like BSA or cytochrome C, as we'll see. The 350 and 330 nanometer ratio fluorescence assumes that tryptophan is the only or primary aromatic amino acid which make up your protein. It is really popular because it's fairly easy to interpret, but the problem is that it works really well for only some proteins, such as IgGs, for instance. And as we know, most proteins are not antibodies or IgGs. And finally, the peak height, which is better suited for samples which have very small changes in the maximum intensity. So each analysis method offers unique information critical to the understanding of your proteins. So what we are viewing here is the exact same data set automatically processed in four ways. Uncle gives you options. So this approach leverages the full spectral range to get as much information as you can. And as we'll see, it allows you to adapt to various types of proteins or formulations as the focus of your lab may change. A special word must be said for the barycentric mean analysis method. 
It combines the benefits of methods more sensitive to changes in the fluorescence intensity, but also changes in the wavelength, allowing for a data dense and a smooth denaturation curve. The output of the BCM is a center weighted mean wavelength of the emission, which you can see here on the y axis. Unlike other methods, which are only suitable for some proteins, this method works for the majority of proteins. And so for this reason, it is the default method on the Uncle platform. However, because we give you options, you just can easily toggle to the other methods which are generated in parallel. Now that we have a good fundamental understanding of DSF and full spectrum fluorescence, let's look at some examples which will go to show you why one needs full spectrum fluorescence. Antibodies are well-characterized large proteins, which are a major part of biologics available today on the market. Antibodies are specific, and they're notoriously stable relative to other types or other classes of proteins, which make them a very popular choice among biopharmaceuticals companies. Typically, as they undergo denaturation, their maximum intensity will decrease as they unfold and expose themselves to the buffer environment. And they will also undergo a shift to the right or redshift in their maximum wavelength. This is typical of an antibody unfolding. As previously noted, the BCM method is a perfectly suited method to characterize antibodies. Following the denaturation curve, one can easily distinguish the native or the flat initial portion of the curve the midpoint or transition, which is the fastest changing section of the curve, and finally the end of the transition. Another benefit of DSF is a simplification of the analysis. There is no need for buffer subtraction or complex statistical methods to do analyses and fit your results in order for you to simply calculate a TM or a TM set. With Uncle, TMs and TM set are automatically calculated, where the software simply takes the first derivative or the differential of the denaturation curve itself. And then at every inflection point, a TM is assigned. And then we use an edge function to determine the actual T onset. Very simple, clean, and accessible to the user. In the example above, for the sake of simplicity, we are only showing you one melting temperature. Note that the uncle can assign up to four TMs automatically. In addition to showing four TMs, the uncle may also calculate the average percent CV and standard deviations for any replicates present in your data set. Okay. While one method gets the job done, uncle goes above and beyond. Users have immediate access to all four analyses of their data. Note that while the TMs may be similar, the different ways of visualizing the data can help us distinguish constructs and formulations. The two lower analysis methods, area and peak height, may be used to look at the effect of conjugation on the potency of proteins. For instance, a sharp initial decrease in the intensity may be indicative of the effect of the conjugation on the hydrophobic moieties or portions of your protein. Enzymes, for instance, may be characterized by the area method. Now let's take a look at another class of protein. Bovine serum albumin, or BSA, is a common globular protein. It is a serum albumin derived from cows. It is often used as a protein concentration standard in live experiments because it can increase the signal in your assays. It doesn't have an effect in many biochemical reactions, and it is fairly inexpensive, and for those reasons, it is extremely popular. It also functions as a cell nutrient, and it's able to stabilize enzymes during restriction digest. So with these vast number of applications, BSA for obvious reasons is ubiquitous in just about every lab. And so the ability to stabilize proteins is believed to be primarily via hydrophobic interactions, even without denaturation of the BSA itself. And so if we were to thermally denature BSA on Uncle, we see that the protein undergoes a decrease in the intensity, but now we actually see a blue shift. Let's take a closer look. Here we're able to see in green the initial emission spectrum of BSA. As it undergoes denaturation, the intensity decreases, but we also see a shift of about a few nanometers to the left. The question now, of course, becomes, can Onco handle blue shifts? Yes, of course it can. Onco offers many options. On the left-hand side, we can see the BCM analysis method, 
where the actual curve appears to be decreasing. This is typical of blue shifting samples, and Uncle can readily calculate the melting temperature, as can be observed here. On the right hand side, we have the area analysis methods, and it's also no challenge for the Uncle, as the intensity is decreasing. It is a suitable method for BSA, and you may also know that the TM, or melting temperature, is also easily generated. So what about cases when there is no redshift? Right, so let's take a look at the example of cytochrome C. It's a small heme protein found loosely associated with the inner membrane portion of the mitochondrion. Um, it is, in its native conformation, typically a very poor fluorophore. It doesn't actually emit much light. And so upon unfolding, we actually see an increase in the intensity of the light emitted by cytochrome C. But you may also note that there's no distinct red or blue shift in this case, right? And so how do we characterize it? If the only analysis method available to you is the fluorescence ratio, say 350 over 330 nanometer, for instance, you will not be able to characterize this protein. And this is because as the intensity at the two wavelengths, 350 and 330, are decreasing at the same rate, your ratio will remain constant. Uncle users do not have to worry about these limitations, as the built-in integrated intensity or area method can easily handle this type of transition. And so here we can see that we can easily see a difference between the initial state of our protein and the final state of our protein, but also we can easily generate or compute a melting temperature for this sample. What about the extreme case of samples which do not contain any tryptophan at all? And so here, you're viewing the overlay of the spectra of samples which essentially only contain tyrosine, right? And so the example here is a very small 6 kilodalton protein uh, whose sequence basically indicated that the only aromatic amino acid present was tyrosine. And so as we can see, the maximum emission is nowhere near 330, right, or even you know, 350 nanometer or so, but rather it's close to 305 nanometer. And so the area can be used to characterize the sample. Right. And so as you can see in the example here, the TM is easily computed, and there are multiple TMs. We're only, again, for the sake of simplicity, showing you one, but you can see that there are multiple inflection points generated. Um, and again, the uncle is exceptionally flexible, and therefore, that sample itself is no challenge for the uncle. And therefore, for you as a user, that makes it much more easier to characterize just about any protein which may come across your bench. So we've seen the flexibility of the uncle in being able to handle just about any sample which undergoes intrinsic fluorescence, whether you have a red shift, a blue shift, whether you have tryptophan or no tryptophan present. But we can also see that color truly helps you appreciate the rich nature of our samples, for instance. And so being able to extend beyond the UV range into the visible opens up a whole new world of possibilities. We've seen the power of Uncle when it comes to tackling intrinsic fluorescence, regardless of the proteins. Uncle has its full spectrum fluorescence, allowing it to easily extend into the visible range. The UV visible spectrum refers to two distinct regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uncle is the only platform which does DSF using both. Intrinsic fluorescence primarily occurs in the UV range of the spectrum, typically under 400 nanometer. And the extrinsic fluorescence typically occurs in the visible region or the colorful part of the electromagnetic spectrum above 400 nanometer and on uncle up to 750 nanometer. This allows us to use dyes to characterize our samples. So dyes are non-protein molecules which absorb light and re-emit them at a longer wavelength. They are often used in the fluorescence labeling of biomolecules, and they can be smaller or more photostable than fluorescence proteins. And so for those reasons, they're extremely popular. They're often used to also label proteins which don't have the ability to fluoresce or to have any intrinsic fluorescence. And so they may also serve as a probe to identify intact sections of the sample. They may also be highly selective and only bind to certain amino acids if they are reduced, for instance or to nucleic acids if a cell is active or undergoing division, right? Um, and so the possibilities are really endless. 
But we are seeing here are three examples where we have C probe, which is commonly used to characterize proteins which don't have any intrinsic fluorescence. We also have fluorescein, which is a common tracer or used as a probe, if you want, in many biomolecular applications. And finally, we have cybergol, which is a dye which binds nucleic acids, but cannot travel across the membrane. As such, it can be used to detect when nucleic acid is actually released into the media. So it may be really useful and powerful to be able to leverage the power of a dye to better understand their proteins or even other molecules. Let's see examples of that. So for those particular applications, Onkel uses its second laser at 473 nanometer. Right? It's able to excite the appropriate dye and then the collected emission spectra in the region from 500 to about 650 nanometer or so are characterized. On the left, we see the emission spectra of proteins which do not contain any aromatic amino acids. Aside from the two laser peaks, we see no signal. 266, 473, these are the lasers. Otherwise, in the intrinsic region, we see absolutely nothing. By adding CPRO to the sample, we're able to excite it at 473, then collect a generous amount of data in the visible region of the spectrum. And as an uncle user, the same trusted platform used for intrinsic fluorescence may also be used for extrinsic or dye-based fluorescence. The same sample requirement, so you're still only using nine microliter of samples, the same software, and the same partner in Enchain Labs to support you along the way. And the resulting denaturation curve here shows a clear transition, so we can see the initial state, the final state, and readily assign the melting temperatures and therefore rank order samples with dyes as well. The animation here shows a transition captured in the emission spectrum of fluorescein. And so we not only see an initial decrease in the intensity, but we also see a slight bump or redshift which happens, and then a second decrease in the intensity. And so that type of behavior is actually reflected in the denaturation curve itself. And so as we can see the intensity decreases, we see the slight bump occur, and then we see again another decrease in the intensity. So now let's look at another very special use for a dye. With increasing commercial success and FDA submissions, I think it's safe to say that gene therapy has arrived, right? And so AAPs have quickly become the de facto vehicle for gene delivery because they are relatively safe, effective, and changes made to the host are not permanent. But AAP development offers some pretty common challenges, right? And so you have to be concerned about stability overall, and there are also challenges which are very unique to that approach. On one end, the question remains of stability. In other words, is my capsid stable? On the other end, we see really unique challenges there where we have to actually wonder whether or not the DNA or RNA being loaded into the capsid is actually remaining within the envelope. To that effect, two models have been brought forth and are supported in the literature. One model shows that it is possible right, for nucleic acids to be ejected from a capsid while the capsid itself remains whole. Another model suggests that it's possible for the actual capsid itself to first fall apart and as it's disintegrating, it's going to then free up or liberate the nucleic acid and release it into the medium. Both pathways to genome ejection have been documented in literature. And so for the user, for the researcher, for the scientist, it will be extremely useful to be able to assess which one is taking place, as it may inform you whether your capsid is actually stable or whether you have other phenomena impacting your ability to have a fully packed capsid. There's one limitation. Nucleic acids are extremely poor fluorophores. In other words, they have really, really low quantum yields. And therefore, we have to rely on dyes to fully understand what exactly is taking place around them. Onkel's recently released capabilities named Barrel Toolbox actually allows you to do just that. So cybergold doesn't fluoresce much when it is unbound to nucleic acid. However, once it comes in contact with DNA or RNA, it begins to fluoresce increasingly in almost a direct proportion to the amount of nucleic acid detected. This ability to serve as a marker for the presence and the relative quantification, if you want, of nucleic acid makes it a very attractive dye. And so Onkel's thermal ramp 
allows us to actually stress the samples in a rank order of the stability of viruses, AAVs, for instance, VLPs, and any other class of viral particles. Users are easily able to determine whether or not their capsids are robust or fragile under various conditions, different pHs, for instance. They may also note whether the ejection precedes the aggregation, which will give you great insight whether, into whether or not your pathway is that of the ejection from a whole capsid or whether or not your capsid itself has disintegrated and therefore aggregated, releasing a nucleic acid into the medium. So Uncle does it all. Whether you're looking to characterize monoclonal antibodies by specifics or even better similars, the Uncle can tackle them. If you are on the smaller size and have globular conformations, for instance, the full spectrum that we see here can also pose no challenge to, to the Uncle. As gene therapy continues to explode, Onco is quickly becoming the right tool for the job. We can use the intrinsic fluorescent capabilities to characterize the viral particles, or we can use the dye-based fluorescence to be able to understand whether or not we're losing nucleic acid under certain conditions. And so you can feel confident and remain assured that Onco will be with you along the way. And no matter what types of molecules you're facing, as the changes are essentially happening constantly in our field, Uncle is flexible enough to allow you to tackle just about any protein. With full spectrum, the possibilities are endless. And so I'd like to invite you to join us for part two, the amazing blue shift, where we'll see exactly how this unique phenomenon can give you significant insight into your protein structure. And finally, we'll round things up in part three, where we'll essentially be able to demonstrate how the exponential benefits of the detection methods are built into the uncle can help you gain insight into both formulations and antibody development. With that said, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and welcome any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. Hey, Rafar, thanks for that great presentation today. Um, hey. I think, uh, great job. Um, so we have some questions in the, in the um, Q&A. If mm -hmm. anybody uh, would like to ask any additional questions, please go ahead and do that now. And uh, Rafar and I will talk through as many of them as we can. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes Zoom does some weird things. So just apologies, everybody, for tiny Rafar. Rafar is actually a really big guy. So it was funny to see how, how small he was <laughs> in the corner there. Sometimes Zoom does some strange things to us. Uh, so Rafar, let's jump into some of the questions. Sure. Uh, first one, can you remind us of um, the wavelengths of your, the lasers in the UNCLE system and the range of wavelengths that it uses? Sure, absolutely. So the UNCLE has three lasers. So one's a UV at 266 nanometer. And so that's the one that we use for intrinsic fluorescence. And so that's the one that will excite your tryptophan, your tyrosine, and your phenylalanine. We also use that one for your temperature of aggregation for smaller particles or lower concentrations. It's much more sensitive. The second laser is at 473 nanometer. That one is used for dye base or extrinsic fluorescence. And so the so-called cyber goal that we saw there, uh, the c -pro, for instance, and other types of dyes which get excited in the blue can be used there. And that's the application for that one. It will collect a spectrum typically from 500 to 650 nanometer in the visible region. That second laser may also be used for the temperature of aggregation using larger particles or higher concentrations. It's much more better suited for those. There is actually a third laser in the uncle. It's at 660 nanometer. That was not the focus of the talk today, but if you join us for part three, Kevin will actually discuss all three of them and the benefits of those three detection methods. That one is used for DLS, but we can also actually measure a temperature of the unfolding, if you want, based on the change in the size of your samples, as well as the temperature of aggregation using VLS as a metric or an observable for that change. Um, the spectrum itself is typically from 250 to 720 nanometers, so it's a full spectrum for every measurement, and that raw data is completely available to you as a user. You can actually right-click and export everything to Excel pretty easily. Okay, great. Thanks, Rafar. Okay, next question here, Rafar. So um, you say that you collect full spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, but I've heard that when people do Cipro measurements, the mm -hmm. TM doesn't always match. Do you, do you have any comments on that? <laughs> sure. And that's actually the benefit of the uncle, right? So if you think about intrinsic fluorescence, you are measuring directly what's happening in the microenvironment around those aromatic amino acids that we talked about. Cipro is a dye-based measurement. 
And while it's useful in cases where you have no aromatic amino acids, it's also non-specific, right? And so what it actually does is that it binds to the non-specific or the hydrophobic moieties or parts of your proteins. And so for, for that reason, there are artifacts of that measurement. And occasionally the TM is going to be a little bit um, off as a result of it. That's the reason why, you know, the uncle is so great. If you can essentially use a UVVIS to measure your protein concentration, right? It means that it has aromatic amino acids and therefore you can use the uncle without any dye. And that's uh, the, the other benefit there. Okay, another question for you here, Afar, in the queue. Um, is there a way to customize or tweak the sensitivity of the processing software, which assigns the TM values? Yes, yes, we absolutely can. So by default, that value is about 10%, but the threshold can be, can be adjusted. And so there's a specific algorithm, and without going into too many details, we take the first derivative of the curve and we assign TMs at the inflection points. There are additional QCs built in to prevent the assignment of artifacts, right? Uh, but certainly, if you want to adjust it either up or down, we give you the option of, of, of doing so. So it's a bit flexible and you can, you can modify that as needed. You can customize it. Okay. A question here on uh, red and blue shift, Rafar, you covered those. Um, mm -hmm. What's the significance of the red and blue shift? Um, and is there any information about the protein unfolding that, that, that it gives? Sure, yeah. So I'm going to give you like a relatively simple answer. And certainly if you drew it for part two, uh, my colleague Keith is going to be a bit more, you know, extensive on his, his, his essentially his review of the blue shift. But in very brief terms, uh, the blue shift tells you usually that you guys essentially have opened up your protein and therefore some of the hydrophobic amino acids, tryptophan for instance, are more exposed to the polar environment. And so as tryptophan becomes exposed to the aqueous buffer, it's going to have a decrease in intensity. And as you saw in the example, there's also going to be a red shift, right? Now, what typically happens when you have a blue shift? In fact, it's the opposite. And so what often happens there is that you have proteins that are either partially folded, misfolded, or proteins that are a little bit smaller, and therefore they don't have the ability to completely conceal themselves, right, perfectly. And so as they actually melt, they begin to stick to each other and they begin to aggregate. And in doing so, they offer a bit of a hydrophobic protection, if you want, to those amino acids, and therefore they appear to be blue shifting. And so it's a, it's a bit of an interesting phenomenon, but it actually gives you direct insight into the initial structure of your samples. Okay, um, another one for you, Rafar, here. So can you do intrinsic fluorescence and dye measurements at the same time, and do you think that would be useful? Yeah, I guess. You can, and that's a, that's a really neat thing there. So although for the sake of this presentation, I covered each wavelength separately, right? The 266 for the intrinsic and the 473 for the extrinsic or the dye-based measurements. The uncle actually runs the two lasers at the same time, right? And so what you can actually do in theory is have your protein there with its intrinsic fluorescence and excited at 266. And you may also have a reporter or another dye. So GFP is an example of that where, you know, a customer may begin to actually express that protein with GFP. And you can actually also track the... Um, changes in structure at different locations in your protein at the same time. And so the hydrophobic moieties or some parts may begin to melt while other sections may, be, may remain intact or you may see the effect that one has on the other, for instance. So you absolutely can do so. Okay, okay. Um, so a question here on uh, T onsets, Rafar. So I keep, um, this one says, I keep wondering how T onset is determined and what does the uh, you know, X percent correspond to? Does it use the same fit as TMs or is there a different approach to get to the T onset? Sure, it's a great question, yes. So if you want to come from a DSC background, T onset is much more complicated. There's a bit more of a fitting that has to be done that's a bit more extensive. In, in Uncle, it's actually quite simple. We take the denaturation curve and the first thing that we do is we take the first derivative of that curve. When we do so, we end up with the inflection point. And so that inflection point or the highest point or the lowest point, but the point where there's a greatest change is typically what we call the TM. And so then we look directly to the left of that at a lower temperature, and we look at a value that is 10% the maximum or minimum reported for the so-called TM. And that value is typically called the T onset or the beginning of the unfolding uh, process. And so that threshold of 10% comes from essentially what is called an edge function, right? It's kind of what people use to decide when things are changing significantly. It's a very nice and elegant way to, to determine when your fluorescence is beginning to change significantly. Okay, a little bit different question here. You mm -hmm. mentioned um, isothermal runs, right? So mm -hmm. temperature holds. Um, how does that work and can you do it with dyes as well? 
Yes, this question, yes. So you absolutely can. So the way it works um, has two components that we can think about, right? Especially if you're a new user to Bianco. The first bit of doing any long-term measurement is that you have to be confident that your sample is not going to evaporate. So the sample holder for the uncle, the uni, is actually sealed completely. And so that allows you to actually load your samples, seal the actual sample itself, and therefore you don't have to worry about evaporation or perhaps things beginning to leak, or if you heat them up, the viscosity causing any changes and things beginning to cross over to other wells, right? So that's one factor. So the way we do so is by giving you a sample holder that is completely sealed, assuring that there's no changes to your sample. The other way that we do so is that the uncle essentially has the ability to hold temperatures constant. So while we do temperature ramps from 15 to 95 degrees Celsius, you may actually choose to remain at one constant temperature for an extended period of time. The longest amount of time that people typically do is about a week. Um, most people, to be fair, typically do runs for about you know, 24 to 48 hours, just an overnight run, for instance, or a long weekend. Uh, and you can certainly measure all three detectors. So you can measure fluorescence, you can measure static light scattering, and you can also measure dynamic light scattering. And you can actually do all three at the same time. Okay, um, Rafar, there are a few questions that are kind of related to this. So I'll try to ask them as a, as a package here for sure, you. So, um, there's a question about how does it work for multimers or for potential samples that are aggregated already before the run? And I think you can probably elaborate. You didn't talk about the light scattering technologies as much, but um, maybe you can elaborate on your experience with uh, using the fluorescence techniques, but um, on samples that may already have some aggregation or that are already into a multimer type form. Sure, that's a good question. Yeah. So if you have a multimer, right, essentially what we measure is the ensemble measurement. So what you are viewing is the contribution for all of the samples. However, when you have a protein that's properly folded, we typically expect it to have a maximum wavelength as close to 330 as you can. And that's because tryptophan is so dominant in its contribution to your, your signal. If you have a sample that is aggregated, that aggregation is going to have an effect on your fluorescence. And so it can actually mask it a little bit or it can influence it. But it's also independent of the fluorescence. And so the beauty for us is that while you may have a sample that is aggregated, you can independently measure it using the SLS or the DLS and confirm that the colloidal properties, also the aggregation properties of your samples have in fact changed. Uh, but you can also still monitor the changes in the actual structure, specifically the microenvironment of the unfolding, right, as you do so. And so again, the, the advantage of this platform is that those three detectors are running concurrently, right? And so if you do a measurement on one sample, you are going to get eight data points using only nine microliter of sample, which is beyond what anyone else can give, you, give to you right now. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other benefit of that is that as each of them are monitored, you may look for correlation between each of them. In other words, is the actual unfolding of one of the monomers or the components of the protein responsible for the aggregation? Is the aggregation happening because that sample is simply unhappy in the condition and therefore it's self-associating but remaining folded? You can actually tell that using the uncle or are there other factors at play there? And, and so again, if you join us for part three, just a free plug, but if you join us for part three, my colleague Kevin will actually discuss the benefit of leveraging all three detection methods at once. Okay, great. Hey, Rafa, I think this will be our last question just due, due to time here for today. Um, but are there any, any chemicals that might interfere with the results or you know, sample conditions that people should be aware of using the UNCLE system or is, can it handle pretty much anything? Yeah, that's a question, yeah. So when we think about chemical compatibility, right, that's usually, the, that's the question here. It's, it's about both material and optical. So let's tackle, let's tackle the material question, it's pretty easy. The actual cuvettes are made of quartz, right? And so they are going to be pretty resistant to most things that you'll use in biology. Unless you were to use some extreme chemistry, which would essentially dissolve glass, you're going to be fine. Most samples in biology are pretty inert. The seals are made up of silicone, and therefore they're also chemically inert to most things, and they're also highly resistant to high temperatures. Right? So from a chemical compatibility, you're going to be fine um, without much concern there. When it comes to optical, you may have some concerns about quenching. Right? And so if you have samples, for instance, that can quench fluorescence, that could be a factor. Uh, and certainly, again, because we have a full spectrum, you may simply look at a different region of the, um, the electromagnetic spectrum to be able to characterize your samples. Other things is because we also have aggregation, we have the SLS as a metric, if for whatever reason you're not able to use fluorescence, very often we have users who simply rely on the actual TAG measurements to rank order your samples and they arrive to the same exact conclusion. And so the benefit here is the fact that 
you have three orthogonal metrics or measurements to characterize your samples. And so you can confirm their behavior. You may also gain additional insight into what's causing a behavior observed in one metric, for instance. Great, Rafar. Hey, thanks for answering all those great questions and thanks for a great presentation today. And as you mentioned, um, I would just ask everyone, if you're interested, please join us for part two on the uh, blue shift and part three on the UNCLE series that's going to dive a bit more into the um, specific applications on the system and how to use that information. Um, I want to thank all of you who have joined us today. We, um, if you'd like to have a deeper conversation with our team, get in touch with us. We're happy to do Zoom meetings with um, team, teams, Zoom meetings one-on-one, -on -one, um, and we'd love to connect with you. Again, thank you for attending part one of our UNCLE virtual seminar series, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a Thanks, Rafar. Cheers.